So good morning, everybody. Um, this I'm I'm Mary Barry, and very well you're very welcome to the Vasclair session of the RCSI Church Day 2022. Um, I'm chairing as the uh, chairman of the Irish Vasclair Society, um, and we've a short but very interesting program this morning where we're going to look at some of the more unusual aspects of vascular surgery and some of the challenges um, associated with some of the more unusual conditions that we encounter. So our first presenter this morning is Mr. Mackie Medini from who's consultant vascular surgeon in the University Hospital Limerick, who is going to talk on a title, A Little Effort Plots a Long Way. Mackie, over to you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Mary, and thank you for the opportunity to present. My name is Mekhi Madani. I'm a vascular surgeon at University Hospital Limerick, and um, I'll be talking today about venous uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, so we're just going to start with a little bit of history, talk about definition, epidemiology, etiology, and go through the anatomy a little bit, history and, present and presentation, and uh, just a couple of cases. So um, it really started around 150 AD where Galen was the first to describe the cervical rib. He was a Greek anatomist and court physician to Marcus Aurelius at a time where uh, human dissection was completely forbidden. And uh, he was the only person that was allowed to dissect cadavers and he described the cervical rib and uh, physicians learned from his text for about a century and a half. This is until around the 1500s where uh, Vesalius came around and did uh, huge numbers of cadaveric dissections and took on teaching an updated Galen's text. Um, and physicians then used the widely spread uh, drawings and, um, from his publishing to learn. Um, up until 1818, a more familiar name, Sir Astley Cooper, who uh, did some seminal work with Ingwell Hernies and was a renowned vascular surgeon, he was the first to really describe the effects of cervical rib on the subclavian circulation and on the upper limb, uh, where he noticed a young lady with a pulseless um, upper, upper limb and uh, digital gangrene with the mass in her neck. And he described it as an exostosis arising from the sixth or the seventh uh, cervical vertebrae. Um, so he was really the first to highlight the effect um, of the cervical rib. Um, not many years after that, um, mm -hmm. Holmes Coote was the first to perform TOS surgery. And in a similar fashion, he had a 26 year old servant who was starting to drop objects, so had some muscle wasting in the hand and then went on to have some gangrene in the hand. And he described the mass in the neck, which he went on to excise and made a very good account and description of all the structures um, that he encountered and how intricate he had to be in carrying out the procedure. Um, the first venous TOS was described uh, really contemporane contemporaneously by both um, James Paget and Leopold von Schroeder. Um, James Paget was a was a British um, pathologist, and he's one of the two founders of pathology with the German Rudolf Burkow. They really introduced the use of the microscope in uh, human studies of infections and tumors. And uh, he described uh, effort thrombosis or venous TOS. And at the same time, uh, von Schroeder did that, but he didn't publish his work till a little bit later. And then a couple of guys from Mayo Clinic, uh, neurosurgeons, they were the first to do scalenectomy only for purely neurogenic TOS. And this is an operation that really took off hugely and uh, was widespread, but it also fell out of vogue very, very quickly because the recurrence rates were extremely high with scalenectomy only. So thoracic outlet syndrome is really a constellation of symptoms uh, that describe the effects of the compression that happens in that uh, thoracic inlet or outlet, if you will, of the neurovascular bundle. There are three subtypes, neurogenic, venous, and arterial. By far, the commonest is the neurogenic, and the second commonest would be the venous at double the rate, really, of the arterial, which is the rarest type, thankfully. Um, the etiology is multifactorial. Um, really, developmental or anatomic anomalies like cervical ribs or bands, um, different uh, scalenous muscle uh, anomalies have been described um, with insertions and attachments. Physical activity is a big uh, factor. Um, particularly any overhead activity or um, strenuous overhead physical exercise. Uh, people with jobs like painters, butchers, um, people 
do a lot of sports or heavy weightlifting, overhead typists, secretaries. These are all people who are a lot more prone to uh, developing TOS. Um, accidents as well are a very big part. There's most of the time there is a an event that sets things off. Even it might be an indolent minor uh, road traffic collision or fall off a bike, uh, but if you dig deep into the history, you usually find an event that triggered the thoracic outlet. Um, it's really a disease of the young people. The average uh, age at presentation is around 32. Very, very small proportion are teenagers and a small proportion are also older than 50. The majority are females when we're talking about TOS overall. So the majority are females, particularly in neurogenic TOS. However, the exception is venous TOS where there is for some reason an observed two to one male preponderance. The true in incidence is really difficult to ascertain because A, it's really underreported and it is underdiagnosed. And when people with thoracic outlet end up at the right place, they've usually been to at least three, four, five different specialists before um, finding you at the door. Um, so the anatomy is really the key here. And uh, you can see it's a really tight space. And so it's between the clavicle and the first rib and the sclenius anterior, sclenius medius muscles attached to the first rib. And you can see the vein coming out the, the costoclavicular triangle as it's called. And then the artery and the nerve, and the, all the brachial plexus nerves come out from the scalenus triangle. And uh, yeah. this, this very tight space obviously gets tighter with abduction of the arm. And that's physiological and normal. There is some compression in all, but in a certain proportion of people, that's a pathological compression. And it's also a very busy area with nerves, as you can see. So the phrenic nerve lays on the scalenus anterior muscle. And it's only nerve, the only nerve in the neck that goes from lateral to medial. And then the brachial plexus is behind um, and very, very closely associated to the scalenus anterior is the subclavian artery. And then the long thoracic nerve of Bell traverses through the scalenus medius. Um, this is a, an inferior view, just showing the same space and uh, just showing where um, each of the structures is susceptible to compression. Um, so from a presentation perspective, um, it's easy to divide them into neurogenic venous and arterial, but when you delve deep into the history and the examination of the patients, most of them will have some form of combination of two or more of these symptoms. So with neurogenic TOS, as expected, you get paresthesia, pain, now, the distribution can be very variable. Um, some people complain of neck pain, shoulder pain, arm pain, pain radiating down the arm on the lateral side or the medial side, pain at night that wakes them up, um, symptoms that are reminiscent of uh, nerve entrapment, whether it's medial, median nerve with a carpal tunnel or ulnar nerve, um, but they can be very nonspecific. A weakness and muscle wasting are advanced um, stages of neurogenic TOS and compression. Um, venous TOS presents like most uh, chronic venous insufficiency or venous hypertension with edema, venous distension, heaviness, and a DVT. And again, it's a spectrum of disease. So you could have venous compression with no thrombosis, and that's known as McCleary syndrome, or thrombosis and a DVT, which is the Paget von Schroeder syndrome. Um, arterial, which is the rarest, it presents again, typical to any arterial insufficiency with fatigue, claudic claudication, coldness, uh, embolization, and thromb thrombosis. And the reason they get the, the advanced stages is the integral injury results in a stenosis and a post-stenotic dilatation, which then uh, has the potential of creating neurothrombus with either thrombosis or embolization. Um, this is just a nice illustrative slide from the JVS that shows um, the mechanism, the pathoanatomy, if you will, of um, thoracic outlet, where you can see that the repeated intimal injury causes circumferential perivenous scar both on the inside and the outside and collaterals are created uh, and formed. And then once an event is, uh, has occurred and precipitates um, occlusion of these collaterals, and that is when the patient will present with a symptomatic um, DVT in the upper limb. Um, Examination, um, there's um, a few described maneuvers. The first thing you would do is a for supraclavicular tenderness or any exoptosis or masses in the neck. The Roos test um, illustrated here at the top is helpful in um, illustrating or reproducing symptoms. Um, pulses at rest and stress, there have been so many different descriptions of how to stress and how to check the pulses and they all have eponymous names. Um, they're really, 
they're helpful to ascertain who gets reprodu reproduction of symptoms, but they're not very uh, specific tests because there's a large population, a percentage of the population that will have a disappearing pulse with no symptoms. And these are really, are not really thoracic outlet. And moving on to imaging, chest x-rays are helpful in looking at cervical ribs, uh, but really the, there can be um, cervical bands that are missed by chest x-rays, but it is always a good starting point. Duplexes are uh, pivotal because not only do they look at the dynamic flow within the vessel and can examine the vessel from the inside, but the stress maneuvers that we carry out when doing the duplex. So I personally created a, a protocol with the vascular lab and uh, it's not really available. You can't find proper protocols for scanning TOSs. And thankfully, uh, during my fellowship, I picked up on that. And uh, they're, they're scanned in four different positions and you can see complete changes from normal at rest to complete cessation of flow with some of the stress positions. And that's extremely helpful in a diagnosis. And axial imaging is usually MR or CT, and that's both arterial and venous faces. And invasive um, imaging is usually saved for intervention. Um, the treatment will obviously depend on the presentation and the acuity of it, whether you see them in the clinic with chronic symptoms or they come in acutely with arterial or venous when you have to treat um, with lysis possibly. And decompression is always considered in, in um, symptomatic patients, not so much for purely neurogenic because the mainstay of treatment is physiotherapy really for purely neurogenic, but there is some uh, benefit to, to about 50 to 60 percent of patients get benefit. So it's not, not a huge amount. Uh, venoplasty and stenting is also an option once decompression is um, carried out. So I'm just going to go through a couple of cases. Um, first case that we that these cases have all been carried out since about back in the last year and a half. So first case is a 21 year old left handed PhD student who presented with sudden onset of left upper limb pain, heaviness, swelling, fatigue and venous distension. Um, this was acute, a one day history with no symptoms prior to the event that suggests arterial or venous or neurogenic TOS. Um, with regards to strenuous overhead activity or heavy uh, lifting, she used to exercise three times per week before the pandemic, but nothing major. However, she was on the OCP, so that's really her main risk factors. Her biggest issue was facilitated by the symptoms. She's a PhD student and she couldn't write more than three lines without having to stop because of the feeling of the heaviness and the pressure in her upper limb. So she went on to... Um, her, her physical exam was consistent with that with swollen upper limb and dilated shoulder or veins. Um, so her duplex here, as you can see, you can see that the subclavian artery is patent, widely open, but the vein is thrombosed with fresh clot and no flow in the vein at all. And on the right of your screen, you'll probably see the MRI image and you can see the arterial um, phase of it with no issues. You can see the venous return here on the right side, but no venous return at all on the left. Again, consistent with an acute um, DBT of the upper limb. So she went on to have a uh, venography, which um, we did with our um, IR colleagues. The wire went through very easily. You can see the occlusion and you can see the collaterals that are formed, suggesting that this is probably not an acute problem, but rather an acute on chronic problem. Um, we did a couple of runs of angiojet, and you can see the result was clearly suboptimal. We angioplastied with a high pressure venous balloon and repeat angiojet. And this was the final result. Now, at first glance, it looks like it may be okay, but when you look closely, you can see exactly at the costal clavicular angle there, there's a fibrotic um, lesion within the vein. And that's not really amenable to angioplasty or to uh, lysis. So we figured that there's no point leaving a lysis catheter overnight because that's not an acute thrombus and it's not going to go away. Um, we angioplasty it again, but as you can see, it still remains. The only positive thing was that the collaterals were actually significantly reduced at the end of the procedure. Um, so at this time, we figured there's nothing really more to be done here because stenting is completely contraindicated in a situation like this where she hasn't been decompressed yet as the rate of stent fractures and thrombosis are extremely high. Um, so postoperatively, her swelling resol resolved, her venous congestion reduced, and her function significantly improved. However, when we scanned her on day three, she had rethrombosis, but she had no recurrence of symptoms. So we discussed the options, and given that she had no recurrence of symptoms, she was discharged on a DOAC. 
And she's been reviewed a clinic at six weeks, three months, six months in a year. And she's been completely asymptomatic with, with return to normal um, activities of daily life. So for her, she wasn't offered any decompression as she was completely asymptomatic and had no arterial component and had no recurrence of symptoms. The second case is a 21-year-old, um, also right-handed, uh, also, sorry, also 21-year-old, but right-handed, um, also PhD student. He had swelling and engorgement nine days prior to his presentation, and this was while he was in the shower uh, washing his head. He was a javelin thrower for a number of years until he injured his elbow and then became a rock climbing enthusiast, which he was um, actively pursuing. So he was fairly built in the upper body and he had no preceding symptoms of arterial venous or neurogenic DOS. His physical exam again was consistent with a right upper limb DVT with a swollen upper limb with veins dilated up to the shoulder. Uh, he was commenced immediately on intravenous heparin and he improved, but he was still symptomatic. Um, this is, uh, these are pictures from his MRA and MRV. And you can see here, this is the MRA at rest and the MRA with stress with the arm abducted. And it's very clear that he has arterial um, TOS as well as venous TOS. You can see the, the, the tight, um, tightness here by um, abducting the arm. And this was reflected on his duplex with significant increases in his velocities. Um, and you can see here the venogram where there's good return from the left side but nothing from the right, consistent with an upper limb DVT. So again, he went on to have um, an angiojet, venoplasty, lysis. Um, you can also see the large collaterals that are formed here. Unfortunately, his results were suboptimal, and uh, we ended up leaving a Craig McNamara catheter in with 24-hour lysis overnight, and his check venogram the next day showed no recanalization of subclavian vein. However, again, his symptoms improved significantly. They weren't resolved completely, but they did improve significantly. So his discussion was a little bit different for two reasons. One, his symptoms were still there and he had an arterial component to his um, TOS. So we just we did, discussed decompression and he chose to defer it for personal reasons with college. Um, but he did come in and have his decompression done. And I have a video here. I hope it works and you hear my audio. So, brachial plexus, C5, C6, first trunk, middle trunk, C7, C8, T1, lower trunk, phrenic nerve, subclavian artery, subclavian vein. This is after a neurolysis and venolysis. And you see here the long thoracic nerve. First strip has been removed. It's its insertion. It's its origin. Um, I hope you could hear that. And you, the, what you saw moving in the back there was the lung pleura. Um, sorry, no. sorry about that. Technical difficulties here. So postoperatively, he had mild winging of the scapula, which was transient and settled um, with physiotherapy, and he had returned to normal function. And um, thankfully, uh, I saw him about three months ago, and um, his right subclavian vein has recanalized completely. You can see here from the duplex that um, it's opened up again. Third case is a 17-year-old rower, one day history of a very similar uh, swelling in the right upper limb, but his resolved completely with elevation and ice. However, his duplex showed a completely occluded subclavian vein and arterial TOS. Now, given that he had no swelling and no symptoms, he didn't warrant any lysis, but because of the arterial and venous compression, I discussed decompression with him and he opted to go for it. Um, so he was anticoagulated and then he had interval decompression, again, relating to school and timing. Uh, he had very aberrant anatomy, but he had a successful decompression. And um, again, his vein recanalized. Um, you can see there, it's only partially recanalized um, and not fully recanalized, mm -hmm. and he's still getting intermittent symptoms, and he's being considered now for a venoplasty and stenting, which is now an option, having not been one before the decompression, now that the mechanical um, obstruction is removed. The last case I have is a little bit different. It's not a thrombotic, it's a non-thrombotic, so it's a McCleary syndrome. This is a 29-year-old right-handed teacher with a two-year-old um, 
baby who she was very debilitated with very rapid fatigability and swelling of her arm whenever she uses it in any sort of abduction. It doesn't even have to be overhead. And um, on uh, imaging, she had both arterial and venous. And you can see here, this is her venous um, duplex with the arm abducted at the right subclavian vein. You can see there's actually absolutely no flow in it. There's complete cessation of flow in it. And there's very, very low flow. Um, and this is the post-op after decompression. Uh, and thankfully, her symptoms have completely settled and she's returned to normal activities. Um, just a slide about catheter directed thrombectomy. Um, I think it works really well in the first two weeks and it should be done for people who are symptomatic and not just treating the scan or the duplex. Um, plasty is, is important post slices and it's important to stress the arm to check for um, TOS or could it be a secondary uh, clot for some other reason. Uh, stenting before decompression is completely contraindicated, as we said, and the timing of the first rib resection relative to the thrombectomy still remains controversial. Um, so in summary, um, thoracic outlet syndrome is a constellation of symptoms and a range of presentations. History and physical are helpful and imaging is crucial and treatment is dependent on both the presentation and pathology. Thank you. I'll take any questions. So, Mackie. Thank you very much, Mackie, for a superb presentation, particularly for the illustrative cases. Um, so we're just running a little short on time. We've, we've a couple of minutes for questions. Um, I understand the questions have to be submitted through the, the live Q&A. Um, so if anyone has any questions, they might just uh, use the Q&A function. Mackie, just while we're waiting for any further questions. Can I just ask you about um, duration of anticoagulation and your, your um, interval decompression um, management? So what's your, what's your preferred uh, duration of anticoagulation and when do you decide to intervene with decompression? So I, I anticoagulate for the, a minimum of six weeks and I'd be happy to operate any time after that. And they're usually on a DOAC and it stopped 48 hours before the procedure. And I started 24 hours after the procedure for a minimum of six weeks post-op as well and get a repeat scan and see the patient and see how their symptoms are. Um, if the repeat scan shows that they have uh, recanalized and they're symptom-free, then that's really it. I follow them up uh, routinely at three, six and one year. Um, but if they remain symptomatic and it's a venous component, then that's when they'd be considered for venoplasty and stenting. And could I just ask you then, if you've decided not to go with decompression, what's your duration of anticoagulation? If you so, decide I mean, to it, go with, say, venoplasty initially um, without decompression and good symptomatic relief, how, how long do you um, anticoagulate for? So that's a really difficult question because I, I would recommend that if somebody had a, a clot and it symptoms did re get resolved with um, decompress with the anticoagulation because of the vein recanalizing, then they should have their surgery because they have a higher risk of that vein occluding again. The first lady I discussed, her vein didn't recanalize, but she remained asymptomatic and she had no arterial component. Hence, she didn't get the de decompression. But if the vein recanalizes, then I would suspect that the risk of recurrence would be much higher and I would recommend decompression. Otherwise, if they don't want decompression, then the anticoagulation would probably be lifelong. But if, if they're decompressed and recanalized, then I discontinue the, the anticoagulation. Okay, now I have two quick questions here. First question is from Professor Simon Cross. In case one, have you recommended uh, stopping the oral contraceptive pill indefinitely? Yeah, yes. So we've been uh, we've been looked at. She's been looked after in conjunction with my hematology colleagues, and they have changed around her contraception to a lower risk one. They've advised her to not go on the um, one that she was on before. Now, and the second question just came in from um, uh, Prakash Madhavan. I'll, I'll read this. I'll just read it out to you. A lot has talked about doing various procedures, but could I put it to you that TOS surgery should be done with one procedure, first rib resection, or is that not what you think? I couldn't agree more. I think, well, it's, it is a first rib resection. It's, it also involves a full scalenectomy of the middle anterior scalene, plaque plexus neurolysis and adhesiolysis. But I think 100%, I couldn't agree more because that's the one operation that can tackle all three subtypes of TOS as opposed to the other operations that are very limited in their scope. 
in so, life. Mackie, we've, we've one minute left. Can I just ask you, have you done many arterial cases? No, I have not actually, even out on fellowship and the, the person that I worked with who does about three a week for the last nine or 10 years, um, I only came across one and uh, it's, it's very rare, thankfully, because they're not easy cases at all. Yeah, they're not, absolutely, they're a nightmare. So yeah. Mackie, thank you very much for a superb presentation and I look forward to referring you some of my more complex cases. Thank you. Thank you too, as do I, thank you. So our, moving on to our next speaker is um, Professor Eamon Malloy, my colleague here in St. Vincent's University Hospital. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome Eamon, who's going to talk to us about systemic vasculitis and its relevance to vascular surgery. Are you there, Eamon? Yeah, um, I'm here. Uh, can you hear me? We can, Eamon. Uh, so I just, I've just, yeah. yeah, I've just introduced you there, Eamon. So okay. thank you very much. So Eamon and I work very closely together with with uh, a lot of these shared complex cases. So I look forward to your presentation, Eamon. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Mary, and thanks uh, very much for the for the opportunity. No, I, I just to, can't uh, see your. Speak. I can't um, see your um, okay. your slides, Eamon. Please, Miss Mary, can you stop sharing your screen so that uh, Mr. Oh, Murray apologies. Can go on? Am I Um, Stop screen sharing. Sorry. It here, but can you see it now? No, I can't. Um, I need to stop. And you know, let me just. Uh... No, um, I did. Okay, Eamon, I think you should be okay. Now you should be able to um, continue with your presentation. Okay. Um, can you see it now? That's no, I can just see Eamon. Oh. Oh, God. Can everybody okay. else see? Uh, uh, Can you try to share your screen again, okay. somebody? Uh, yeah, I'm, I, it's, it's telling me that I'm screen sharing and I can see the presentation in my screen. So I'm not quite sure what the, what the problem is here. Um, yeah, it looks like nobody can see your slides, Eamon. Um, okay, uh, wait a sec, let me just... Uh, um, Okay. Um, I don't know. Do you want to go on with the next speaker? I'll, I'll email it to my Vincent's email and see if that works. Um, okay. Um, is, um, is Dr. Kibbe happy to? Hi. Yes, I'm happy to go ahead and start. So let me um, go ahead. So and I will. Good morning, Dr. Kibbe. And, and thank you very much for agreeing to speak at our um, vascular session. Um, I'm sorry we can't meet in person, so you're very welcome to Dublin and you've brought the good weather with you. So um, <laughs> just to introduce Dr. Kibbe, um, Dr. Kibbe is, is current Dean of the University of Virginia School of Medicine, Professor in the Department of Surgery and Biomedical Engineering. She's also Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. Yes, Kibbe, can you go on full uh, screen so we can your slides in full? We're trying. Will I keep, so uh, Dr. Kibbe is, is current editor-in-chief of the of JAMA, past president of the Association of Academic Surgery, Midwestern Vascular Surgical Society, and Association of VA Surgeons. She's board certified in general and vascular surgery. And um, so Dr. Kibbe's bibliography includes over 200 peer-reviewed manuscripts, review articles, book chapters, with an emphasis on nitric oxide biology and nitric oxide based therapies for patients with vascular disease. Dr. Kibbe has won numerous awards and um, has been awarded the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers by President Barack Obama in 2010. 
and more recently in 2019 has, has been honored with the presidential citation from the Association of VA Surgeons and also has been awarded the American Medical Student Association Women Leaders in Medicine Award. So we look forward to Dr. Kibbe's presentation on fluoroquinolones and what we don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Berry, and it is wonderful to be here. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to the live portion of tomorrow's meeting because it has been great to explore your amazing country and be here in Dublin. So I'm actually sitting in, in the college building right now. So what I'm gonna talk about is um, not directly related to my own research, but more a topic that I think is important to all vascular surgeons. And in fact, I would say, this is a topic that I'm very much enjoying presenting to all surgeons, regardless of their discipline, because I think this is something that is important to know. As it pertains to this talk, I do not have any relevant uh, financial disclosures. So fluoroquinolones, we are all very familiar with this class of medications. It is the most commonly prescribed class of antibiotics in the United States and among the top 10 antibiotics prescribed worldwide. And interestingly, at least half of these prescriptions are typically for uh, unapproved diagnoses. Now, fluoroquinolones, their mechanism of action to remind us, because for many of us, it's been a while since we studied this, they interfere with DNA replication by preventing bacterial DNA from unwinding, as you can see in this cartoon graphic, and duplicating. So then it leads to cell death. Now, most of us are familiar with the actual indications for use, but just to review them here, the indications for use for fluoroquinolones are for genitourinary infections, hospital-acquired urinary catheter infections, hospital-acquired pneumonia, community-acquired infections when the risk factors for multidrug resistance are present, and then serious acute cases of pyelonephritis or bacterial prostatitis. So I think many of us as physicians are um, very familiar with these indications, but what I fear many are not familiar with is the fact that there have been quite a few FDA warnings issued with regards to the class of fluoroquinolone antibiotics. Let me just review some of these so folks are aware. So these are the various different FDA black box warnings. So in 2008, so that was quite some time ago, was the first black box warning. And basically they issued the warning on all fluoroquinolones advising on the increased risk of tendon damage. Then in 2011, another warning came out uh, regarding a risk of worsening symptoms for those with myasthenia gravis. In 2013, the FDA added that there was a risk for potentially irreversible peripheral neuropathy. I just want to say that again, irreversible peripheral neuropathy. In 2015, the FDA stated that the risk was greater than the benefit for the treatment of acute bacterial sinusitis, acute bacterial exacerbation of chronic bronchitis, and uncomplicated UTI, which of course Cipro and Levo were very commonly used for. In 2016, the FDA found that systemic use of fluoroquinolones was associated with disabling and potentially permanent side effects involving tendons, muscles, joints, nerves, and central nervous system. And then in 2018, they also said that the concerns regarding low blood sugar and mental health problems were added. And while this slide is showing you some of the FDA black box warnings, I want to point out that very similar warnings have been posted by the Health Products Regulatory Authority and the European Medicines Agency. And to show you this is from the European Medicines Agency. And their quote, I think, is a very interesting quote. So you can see, based on the available evidence, the EMA concluded that the drugs under investigation are associated with serious, known, debilitating, 
long-term and potentially irreversible side effects on one or more organ systems, such as tendinitis, tendon failure, arthralgia, extremity pain, gait disorders, neuropathies associated with paresthesias, depression, fatigue, memory impairment, sleep disorders, uh, and impairment of hearing, vision, taste, and smell. And this was put out in November of 2018. So with that, I will now pose to you who are listening to this talk, are you still prescribing fluoroquinolones? Given all of those warnings that have been issued by the EMA and the FDA? And even worse, have any of you still been taking fluoroquinolones? Again, Cipro is pretty common. I can tell you that after I saw all those warnings, I certainly don't. Now, we're in a vascular session, so let me bring this back to our area of vascular disease. So abdominal aortic aneurysms, as we all know on this call, aneurysms are a common disease, estimated prevalence 48%. And of course, they're associated with significant morbidity and mortality. And I don't think I need to tell anyone on this uh, Zoom that the pathophysiology is multifactorial and involves inflammation, destruction of the extracellular matrix, and alteration of elastin and collagen, put very, very simply, as we all know. So could there be an association between fluoroquinolones and aortic aneurysms? Because certainly you saw that some of the earliest evidence with fluoroquinolones was about tendons. So let me show you some of the data so that you all can make your own decisions. So one of the first studies to, to be published on this topic came out in 2015, and this was in JAMA Internal Medicine, and this came from a study from Taiwan. Now this was a nested case control analysis involved almost 1,500 patients and almost 150,000 match controls from the Taiwan National Health Database from the years that you see. And here the exposure that they were looking at was a, was a prescription for an oral fluoroquinolone for three days or longer. That's it. Think about that, you all. Three days or longer. And they then looked at whether it was current use, past use, or prior year use. And the outcome they were looking for after just having this one prescription of fluoroquinolone was if you became hospitalized for an aortic aneurysm or dissection. So hospitalized, pretty severe extreme, I think we would all agree. So what did they find? They found that with current use, past use, and use a, over a year ago, there was an increased rate ratio associated with taking the fluoroquinolones and developing an aortic aneurysm or dissection. And as you can see, that rated for, that went from 1.5 up to 2.4, increased rate ratio from one prescription. And when they looked at this in the different categories, you could see that the rate ratio was increased for aortic aneurysms only, dissections only, aneurysms undergoing surgery, dissections undergoing surgery, and aortic aneurysms or dissections undergoing surgery. So all of these different categories, there is an increased risk taking one prescription of fluoroquinolones. They also looked at duration of use, and they found that the risk increased with the longer you took the antibiotic. So you can see that if adjusted to less than three days, you can see in taking three to 14 days, the risk was 1.6. Greater than 14 days, the risk went up to 1.8. Now the limitations of this study, there are limitations. This was mostly an older patient population. Again, this was limited to patients taking a fluoroquinolone and then getting hospitalized. So what about all the patients that may have had developed an aneurysm but didn't become symptomatic and land in the hospital? We don't know. There was no comparator antibiotic and it's a pretty homogeneous patient population. So the next study that came out, and this was uh, pretty close in timing, was in 2015 from Canada, and this came out in BMJ Open. 
This was also a longitudinal cohort study, and this was in older patients, so adults turning 65 years of age and older. Same exposure, a fluoroquinolone prescription, and here they were looking at subsequent development, a tendon rupture, retinal detachment, and aortic aneurysm that basically uh, landed the patient in the hospital or the ED within 30 days of the prescription. This I show just to show you how common they found when they looked at the cumulative percentage of patients exposed to at least one fluoroquinolone. You can see that by the time somebody reaches 80 years of age, about 40% of that population has been exposed to a fluoroquinolone. So again, just to show you how common this antibiotic class is. But what did they find? So they found that fluoroquinolone use was associated with an increased hazards risk of all of those different collagen-associated adverse events, tendon rupture, retinal detachment, and aortic aneurysm, as you can see there. When they then looked at the association of the fluoroquinolone prescription with the risk of aortic aneurysms, I found this to be very interesting because what they found is it did not matter what your comorbidity was. For example, whether you had diabetes or not, you still had an increased risk. Whether you had high blood pressure or not, whether you had renal disease or not, and you could see COPD, hypothyroidism. So really it was independent of the comorbidity. So I thought this was very important. Now this study also has limitations. It's an older patient group. It's limited to aneurysms, again, that are detected in the hospital or the emergency department. And there were new, no true comparator antibiotics for this. Now, the Swedish study came out several years later. So this was published in 2018 in BMJ, again, a national historic cohort study, this time with linked registered data from Sweden. The, the participants were individuals who had prescriptions, fills for fluoroquinolone or amoxicillin. So here we have a comparator antibiotic for 50 years of age and older. And here, their statistical analysis was more sophisticated. There was a propensity score matched analysis with a 120-day look back to exclude individuals who had taken antibiotics in the prior 120 days or were hospitalized in the prior 120 days. So a little bit of a cleaner analysis. Now they too, though, looked at first diagnosis of aneurysm or dissection uh, that landed them in the hospital or the ED within 60 days of the prescription. So what did they find? They had over, they started with almost 2.2 million individuals, and you can see on the fluoroquinolone side, about 1.3 million uh, episodes of fluoroquinolone prescriptions, and the amoxicillin was about a little over 800,000. And in the end, with the propensity score matched analysis, it's about 360,000 prescriptions in each arm. And here is what they found. So you can very clearly see that the cumulative incidence of aortic aneurysm or dissection within 60 days of that one prescription fill was higher with fluoroquinolones. And the hazards ratio was 1.6. And you can see here, it did not matter if you were male or female. And if you were 50 to 64 years of age, or greater than 65, they all had an increased hazards risk of developing an aneurysm. This study too had limitations, adults greater than 50, limited to aneurysms detected in the hospital or the ED. Only one comparator antibiotic was examined here, amoxicillin, and again, it's a pretty homogeneous patient population. But after those three studies were published, what do you think happened next? Because those were three very important studies. Guess what? There was another FDA black box warning that was issued. So here's the black box warning that was issued in December of 18 after those three studies were published. So you can see here that the FDA, the US FDA issued, quote, that fluoroquinolone antibiotics can increase the occurrence 
of rare but serious events of ruptures or tears in the main artery of the body called the aorta. And they went on to say fluoroquinolone should not be used in patients at increased risk unless there are no other treatment options available. And people at increased risk include those with a history of blockages. This is what I find interesting. Here's what, and I showed you those three studies that this was based on. So those uh, people at an increased risk include those with a history of blockages or aneurysms of the aorta, high blood pressure, certain genetic disorders, and the elderly. Now, let's think about that. Because I showed you the studies, the three studies that that statement was based on. I would say, what about the younger patients? They just said there's only an increase, a concern in the elderly. I certainly showed you a study that went down to 50. I certainly showed you studies that showed that it did not matter what your comorbidity was, there was still a risk. And they're really limiting this again. What about what happens to patients who take fluoroquinolones and may develop aneurysms de novo, but don't simply have such a severe extent that land them in the hospital or the ED? And again, what about more heterogeneous populations? So I was a little surprised that that FDA warning was so incredibly restrictive, given the evidence of at least those three papers that I just showed you. So after saying this, we had a goal. So we wanted to look at the association between fluoroquinolones in the US, which is a more diverse population, over a much larger age range with better comparators and a st more rigorous statistical analysis to really address some of these questions. So our hypothesis with it was that fluoroquinolones increased the risk of aortic aneurysms in all adults, not just the elderly with high blood pressure and with a genetic disorder, in all adults. That is our hypothesis. So we did this and we did publish our work and this was published last year in, in 2021. What we used is we used the market scan uh, database, which is a health insurance claims database across the continuum of care. So this uh, database is a little different from others because it has inpatients, outpatients, and it has outpatient pharmacy. Now, but it does have limitations because this database is pretty much limited to folks who are employed. So this would be folks who are employed and anybody else who's on their insurance plan. So it has 40 million employees, their spouses and dependents. But notice the age range here. It goes from 18 to 64. So this is the reason we chose to use this database because we really wanted to see is the risk there for younger, healthier patients given that FDA warning. So our exposure was an outpatient fill of an oral fluoroquinolone or a comparator antibiotic. And here we included many comparator antibiotics as you can see from the list. We also looked over a longer time period, 90 day incidence of developing an aneurysm or dissection after that one prescription. And then we had a pretty rigorous statistical analysis. These again were all the different fluoroquinolones we included in the study, as well as all of the different comparator antibiotics in the control group that we included. So we started out with over almost 50 million uh, adults in this cohort. And after our exclusions, we ended up with 9 million fills of the fluoroquinolones and 38 million in the comparator group. What did we find? So here's the main findings. We found that there was an increased hazards ratio of developing an aortic aneurysm, and this would be an abdominal aneurysm, an iliac aneurysm, and requiring, look at the risk, it goes even higher for an aneurysm repair with that one <coughs> prescription of fluoroquinolones within 90 days of taking that antibiotic. To me, that's pretty impressive again. And you can see that we also looked, there's no difference if you're male or female. Now what we did find at looking at the age in this cohort is you can see the risk was not there in the 18 to 34 year old group. But if you were 35 years of age or older, you had an increased risk.
Did not matter if you had diabetes, hypertension, or hyperlipidemia. So do we have limitations? Absolutely. So the limitations in our study could include confounding for the indication for the antibiotic use. So there's been some uh, debate on this topic, for example, that whether the indication was pneumonia versus a UTI, that if, you're, if your indication is for pneumonia, you may be picking up more in the aneurysms because you're getting chest x-rays, for example. And so there could be confounding for the indication. We also acknowledge there could, and that's what the second is, confounding due to the imaging obtained. We were unable to determine if the subjects had a pre-existing aneurysm. And that is something that concerns me, is somebody who already has an aneurysm and takes a fluoroquinolone, are they at a significantly more increased risk to actually develop a, a significant expansion or rupture? And then again, the market scan database is limited to an employed cohort. So really not able to look at the elderly or the uninsured with our study. So I would say, what has been the reaction after our study? And there's been about two other studies that have been looking at this. And I'll tell you the reaction all over the internet is the stories of fluoroquinolones. They're there. And when you have patients who actually do look this up on the internet, they find all of these different stories about um, fluoroquinolones and the harms that they can uh, cause. And of course, the class action lawsuits, oh my gosh, I'm just showing you a few, um, but when I do a Google search, I find many different um, class action lawsuits and different law firms that are trying to solicit the business for this. But most interestingly was this. Did you guys realize that there have been some fluoroquinolones removed from the market? But look at this down here, Leviquin and Floxin removed in December of 17, but the company denies that the removal was tied to any risk. In fact, if you dig deeper as to why Leviquin was removed, some of the answers you'll see from the internet is, oh, there are plenty of other options available on the market. I find that interesting. Now, given these studies that have now come out, clearly showing an association between uh, taking fluoroquinolones and aneurysms, have the prescription rates changed? So this was a study that just came out near the end of last year, and they have showed that prescription rates are actually now starting to decline for fluoroquinolones. And what this study showed is that after the first set of warnings, not, not this, the most recent one for aneurysms, but after all those first ones for the tendons, et cetera, there was a 3.4% absolute decline. And then after that second warning related to the aneurysms, there's been an additional 0.8% decline in the prescriptions. So this is good. This is definitely heading in the right direction, but I would say we should be seeing a much more significant decline than this. When I actually do a little search on Google, and I just did this recently, where I asked, are fluoroquinolones still prescribed? I found this to be entertaining. It said the FDA has warned consumers about fluoroquinolones like Cipro and Leviquin for more than a decade, but they're still one of the most prescribed outpatient drugs in the United States. And then last night, I also searched, are they being prescribed in Europe? And so this was the response I got in uh, Google last night. The use of fluoroquinolones and quinolone antibiotics was legally restricted by the European Commission in March of 19, before this, fluoroquinolones were among mm. the most popular. But when you read the restriction, the restriction from the European Commission is very similar to the same FDA black box warning, so you still can prescribe them. Now I'm going to end with one last section because we are all vascular surgeons on this call and you may be thinking, well, what is the mechanism on how these fluoroquinolones might be resulting in aneurysm? So I will show you a few slides on this because I do think it is very interesting. Again, we all know that there's a robust role for inflammation involved in aneurysm formation with activation of the MMPs and basically breakdown of elastin and collagen. 
So Scott Lemaire, uh, one of our own uh, in the United States at Baylor, so he actually looked at this. And so if I, I just want to briefly walk you through this study. So he used mice and he used a very common model of developing aneurysms, which is basically exposing the aorta to an angiotensin II infusion. And so what you can look at is challenged means the mice that got the angiotensin II. And then you can clearly see on the right hand side, the mice that got the angiotensin II and the Cipro compared to the mice that got angiotensin II and saline. I think it is pretty obvious when you look at this picture that the mice taking the ciprofloxacin have pretty severe aneurysms of their aorta. Those look horrendous. And then looking between males and females, he saw that there was a similar development. Um, the light blue are the ones with the angiotensin II and the cipro compared to the dark blue, the teal, that got the saline. So you can appreciate again that in all of the animals that got the cipro, the light blue, there are significant aneurysms, dilations, dissections, rupture. Now looking at the mechanism of action, he took it one step further and looked at a few things. And what you can see is looking in the right side of each graph. So this is the challenge, the ones that got the angiotensin II. You can appreciate that the ciprofloxacin led to increased elastin fiber degradation, a reduction in LOX, and LOX is what stabilizes our crosslinks, our elastin and our collagen. And then you can also see an increase, dramatically so, in MMP2 in, in MMP9 with the use of Cipro. So in summary, mechanism of action. Uh, fluoroquinolones do appear to stimulate the MMPs, which induce degradation of collagen and elastin, reduces LOX, which prevents the cross-linking and the stabilization, and reduces de novo production of collagen. I did not show you that, and also induces oxidative stress, which I did not show you that. Multiple mechanisms by which the fluoroquinolones are doing damage. So in summary, Fluoroquinolone use is associated with the development of aortic aneurysms and dissections. Just one prescription is the data that I showed you. The risk appears to be present for ages 35 years old and greater. The risk is present for healthy individuals as well as those with comorbidities. And the risk is even greater for those with pre-existing aneurysms. For the sake of time, I had to take those slides out of this talk. And then the mechanism does appear to be related to increased MMPs, reduced locks, and increased oxidative stress. So I will conclude by saying, given all of the black box warnings issued by the FDA and the statements issued by the EMA for fluoroquinolones, and the most recent black box warning for the formation of aortic aneurysm dissections, I personally believe that this entire class of antibiotics should be removed from the market entirely, but it has not yet been removed. So I hope you will all remember this talk next time you were thinking about um, prescribing a fluoroquinolone, and I certainly that um, hope that all of you will think about this if anyone is gonna try to prescribe you a fluoroquinolone to take. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present in this session. I'll take questions. Let's see. I don't see any questions yet. Is Dr. Barry there? Dr. Barry might be having some audio challenges. Yeah. Professor Malloy, can you still hear me? I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully you got your slides okay. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> I'm gonna, maybe I'll just try to get them up here while we're waiting. I think I see one question that came in um, from Professor Cross. So I will read that. Um, it says, frightening information, exclamation mark. Thank you for saying that. 
Should all patients greater than 35, should they be entered into AAA screening programs? And are the urologists changing their practice? These are all really good questions. And this is why I've been, it's a topic that I've been starting to talk about more because I really feel that there's many of us who are unaware of all of these black box warnings. And again, this should not be limited to vascular surgeons because so many physicians prescribe these, this class of antibiotics. Um, so to my knowledge, no, there's no registry. And to my knowledge, I don't believe the urologists have changed their um, patterns, but I could be wrong since I'm not a urologist. Thank you for that question. I think if that's it, oh, and I just got a visit from Dr. O'Connell over here. <laughs> so I think I might be turning it back over to you, to um, Professor Malloy, if you're ready. I think Dr. Berry might have connection problems. Okay, uh, can you see my slides there? Okay, great. Um, okay, well, I think I did get a brief intro earlier on from Mary, so I'll uh, just uh, get started uh, with the talk. Um, and uh, thanks again to Mary for the invite to, uh, to, to speak to you today. Um, so um, just the overview really of, of what I was going to try to cover briefly was when to suspect systemic vasculitis, uh, how we diagnose it and, and how we treat it, and just to, to um, emphasize the role of, of uh, vascular surgery. We're really going to spend the whole time talking about large vessel vasculitis, um, the, the, the diagnosis in terms of clinical presentation, imaging, uh, the, the use of temporal artery ultrasound, as well as large vessel imaging techniques, and of course, the role of the temporal artery biopsy uh, treatment, uh, corticosteroids, and just we'll briefly mention other immunosuppressants, and then the, the role for vascular intervention. Um, and uh, from the point of view of vascular surgery, obviously the, the diagnosis may very well um, fall to you in terms of the, these patients may present to the vascular clinic, and they may present with limb claudication in the setting of large vessel vasculitis, but obviously things like leg ulcers and digital gangrene may develop in patients with uh, small or medium uh, uh, vessel vasculitides. Uh, arterial biopsy and, and vascular intervention, obviously the other key areas. Um, so this is the uh, revised nomenclature in 2012 for the different forms of vasculitis, and they're uh, divided uh, roughly on the basis of the size of vessel involved. And we're really going to spend our time talking about the large vessel vasculitides, uh, tachyastus, and, uh, and, and giant cell arteritis, which are the primary types of large vessel. But it's important to point out that there are a number of other systemic disorders that can cause secondary large vessel vasculitis listed here. Uh, as well as uh, uh, we need to consider a whole variety of other processes that might mimic a large vessel vasculitis and, and may be difficult to distinguish. Um, um, and these obviously include atherosclerotic uh, vascular disease, uh, which is much more common than vasculitis, but then a variety of other things like genetic disorders, fibromuscular dysplasia, et cetera, that, that are uh, uncommon also. Um, so uh, one uh, slight area of controversy is in, term, in terms of the nomenclature of large vessel vasculitis and uh, uh, the original ACR criteria in 1990 set out that you, um, uh, uh, if you developed large vessel vasculitis over the age of 50, that you had giant cell arteritis and under the age of 40, uh, you had tachyasus. Uh, fortunately for some of us, uh, you seem to be precluded from developing large vessel vasculitis in your 40s. That anomaly was rectified in the um, more recent uh, nomenclature uh, where the cutoff was 50, but it seems a little bit odd that you, if you develop it at 49, um, you've tachyasis and at 51, you've got giant cell arteritis. And really this uh, uh, significant um, school of thought that maybe these are the same disease that they just look a little bit different at, at the at different ends of the age spectrum, because there are a lot of similarities um, and maybe the differences that are there might be explained on the basis of vascular aging immunosenescence and, and ethnicity, et cetera. And um, so, so while that theory is there, um, they, they do continue to be considered distinct entities pending evidence of shared causality. But for much of the talk, I'm going to talk about large vessel vasculitis, which really encompasses both of these uh, primary forms. Um, the diagnosis of vasculitis is uh, to uh, the belabor the point is, is really like putting the pieces of the jigsaw together. A careful history and physical exam are essential. Uh, blood tests may provide some assistance. Urine tests more of use in the small to medium vessel vasculitides, 
And then imaging um, uh, is particularly important uh, as well as uh, biopsy. So uh, if we turn to giant cell arteritis, uh, for many years, the diagnosis rested on the identification of a clinical uh, uh, or compatible clinical picture. You can see the very enlarged and uh, engorged uh, temporal artery there, which is likely to be pulseless and uh, tender to touch. Um, and then the temporal artery biopsy on the bottom left there with the, the giant cells and the transmural inflammation in, in the temporal artery wall. Uh, however, we do have a number of uh, newer modalities which uh, can be of uh, benefit, um, temporal artery ultrasound, as well as the large vessel um, imaging techniques uh, shown here, the CT angio and, and the PET scan. When we think about the clinical presentation of giant cell arteritis, um, obviously it's most famous for causing uh, cranial vessel involvement, and that obviously led to the uh, terminology uh, referring to it as temporal arteritis. Uh, but in fact, large vessel vasculitis is really present uh, to a greater or lesser extent in, in nearly all of these patients. In addition, sometimes patients can present with a constitutional syndrome without any cranial uh, involvement um, uh, at all. Uh, and we need to consider the diagnosis of giant cell arthritis in these settings. And just in a very general sense, the symptoms uh, of large vessel vasculitis may relate to the systemic inflammation, the typical constitutional symptoms of fever, weight loss, myalgias, arthralgias, fatigue, etc. Arterial inflammation may give rise to headache and scalp tenderness over the temporal artery, thoracic pain uh, or carotidinia. And then arterial compromise can obviously cause limb claudication, abdominal angina, uh, vessel dissection or aneurysm, uh, coronary uh, and uh, artery uh, involvement with angina or heart failure, lightheadedness and uh, TIA or CVA. But the other key point is that asymptomatic disease progression can occur. Uh, and that's what's important for us to bear in mind when, we, when we're imaging patients. Um, just in terms of cranial vessel involvement, really, um, the, um, this just lists the, the, uh, um, the, the positive and negative likelihood ratio for each of these different uh, features. But the bottom line really is that absence of cranial manifestation certainly does not exclude the diagnosis of, gi of giant cell arthritis. Um, what about blood tests? Well, um, obviously, we may see evidence of inflammation with elevated ESR, CRP, anemia, elevated platelet count in patients with large vessel vasculitis. But this is not just in the setting of vasculitis. Uh, we, there obviously uh, can be seen in the setting of infection, cancer, and other disease processes. It's also really important to note that a small percentage of patients, maybe as, much as, uh, maybe as many as 10%, will have normal or near normal uh, uh, inflammatory markers. And paradoxically, these patients are more likely to develop vision loss or stroke, um, and obviously may also have a delay in diagnosis. Um, antibody tests for, for diagnosis of other forms of systemic autoimmune disease really are, are negative by definition, uh, but can have a role in excluding alternative diagnoses. But the key point is that there's no lab test that can prove or disprove the diagnosis. In the setting of tachyacids, there may be an even higher proportion of patients that have normal ASR and CRP. So what about temporal artery biopsy then? So um, there are some pros and cons in terms of there's a false negative rate uh, with maybe 15 to 25% in randomized clinical trials, but probably even higher in general practice um, and uh, uh, operator uh, dependent. Um, there are pros, however, in terms of the, really it's probably the most objective evidence of the diagnosis of giant cell arteritis. And it may rarely show evidence of other forms of vasculitis, other vas vasculitis that can also cause temporal arteritis. Uh, complications are rare. Um, there is recent data from the Mayo Clinic, which would suggest that the temporal artery biopsy can be positive in many cases up to 12 months after initiation of steroids. So um, the, the guidelines uh, typically do um, uh, recommend uh, performing a temporal artery biopsy in patients with suspected um, uh, GCA. Um, so potential pitfalls, um, obviously there, there may be skip lesions and a variable level of, in, of inflammation throughout the, the same vessel. Um, but this can be overcome by uh, a, an experienced pathologist examining the slides and uh, also obtaining multiple sections uh, through the sample. Um, the other potential pitfalls would be a too short of a segment of, of uh, the temporal artery, which should be at least two centimeters and um, over enthusiastic stripping of periarterial tissue, which may uh, reduce the, the yield also. And obviously this is less likely to occur in the hands of an experienced surgeon. So what about temporal artery ultrasound? And uh, the, there are proponents of this, and the, there's a lot of um, different differing opinions. Um, certainly, the, the overall studies would suggest that, um, that, that there, the temporal artery ultrasound is useful. This halo sign uh, can uh, uh, 
seems to be a surrogate for vessel wall inflammation or edema, um, and that it performs pretty well as compared to a temporal artery biopsy. Um, the halo does seem to disappear over time with steroid treatment after a mean interval of 16 days in this study and these studies, but um, other studies have been have demurred and suggested maybe that it's no better than a, than a clinical exam and, and predicting uh, the uh, the positivity of a temporal artery biopsy. Um, it is also operator dependent. You do need a skilled ultrasonographer and obviously to have the availability uh, of the equipment. Um, there are some that might say that it could be used to target a biopsy site or maybe to exclude a giant cell arthritis if there's a low uh, clinical pretest probability. Temporal artery MRI has also been used, and you may see in the bottom right here that there is, in particular, that you can see this in enhancement with, with contrast and neural thickening, which um, I, I think we, you, you could say clearly looks like it's an inflamed artery. And, and there is increasing interest in this um, uh, in, in recent years. Uh, but it's clearly not widely available is the, is the big drawback here. So just to summarize then, the temporal artery biopsy is felt to be the preferred test for confirmation of the diagnosis, but a negative biopsy certainly does not exclude GCA. And obviously the biopsy procedure should not delay institution of stereotherapy because uh, it, it's, uh, the biopsy will be positive for likely for many months after uh, starting steroids. Temporal artery ultrasound may well be confirmatory in, in high probability cases, um, and uh, may uh, be uh, able to rule out GCA in, in, in low probability cases. Uh, the role of triple artery MRI, I think, in routine practice is, is yet to be uh, defined. So just in terms of large vessel vasculitis in the setting of GCA, there were some early reports as far back as the 30s, but historically very much this was under-recognized because of the dominant association with the cranial uh, presentation, but also because of the lack of um, uh, uh, imaging studies that could visualize the, the large vessel of vasculitis, but also because symptomatic events typically occur late, many years after the diagnosis of GCA in, in, in a significant proportion of cases, and the connection may not be made back to the pre or prior diagnosis of GCA. Um, they may well have been discharged from the follow-up in the rheumatology clinic at that time. So um, the large vessel involvement is overt and up to 25% with aneurysms, occlusions, affecting the aorta and any of the major branch vessels, but carotid and the subclavian arteries, uh, as well as the thoracic aorta are the most frequently involved. And clearly this is the, the main source of increased mortality in patients with GCA. There is some data to suggest there may be subclinical large vessel vasculitis in, in all patients. And this is going back to a study in the early 1970s, uh, where uh, this was a very dedicated um, uh, Scandinavian uh, pathologist, and she actually sectioned the, um, the vascular tree all the way from the origin of the aorta all the way down to the elbows and knees every two centimeters. And um, this was the slide of the 13 GCA and one Takayasu patient uh, that she had studied. Uh, in bold are the areas of active vasculitis. And at one quick glance at the slide, you'll see that every single patient had evidence of large vessel, active large vessel vasculitis. And this is all the more sobering when we uh, re realized that in fact, um, this, uh, uh, 10 of these patients had been treated for up to seven years uh, with uh, steroids. So uh, the complications then of large vessel vasculitis, obviously there's a risk of stroke with the cervical artery involvement, uh, limb claudication, predominantly upper limb, but it, it certainly can be seen in the lower limbs, and aortic aneurysm and dissection. Um, this thoracic aortic aneurysm rupture um, typically occurs late. So you can see 33 out of 41 cases here from the Mayo Clinic presented at a median of seven years after the diagnosis of a cranial joint cell arthritis. And um, this is from Mayo Clinic also, they, their uh, odds ratio in a population-based cohort study was 17-fold increased risk of, of thoracic aortic aneurysms with a, just a slight increase in abdominal aortic aneurysms in the GCA patients as compared to controls. Um, so really with all patients with suspected joint cell arthritis should be examined at least by history and physical examination for the possibility of large vessel vasculitis. And certainly if there's any symptoms or signs uh, uh, relevant, then we, then we should get an imaging study of the aorta and the major branch vessels. So in terms of the features we're looking for in clinical assessment, obviously any kind of limb claudication, but reduction in pulses or blood pressure asymmetry or a murmur or brewery over the blood vessel, blood vessel and uh, particularly the auxiliary breweries can be uh, a pointer in uh, patients with GCA. So how good is this clinical exam in predicting uh, the presence of arteriographic lesions? And uh, this study um, did a, uh, had a prospective a standardized physical exam and angiography and uh, looking at all of the exam findings in combination, at least 30% of arteriographic lesions were missed. So the presence of 
um, a finding on, uh, on exam is highly predictive of a, the a presence of an arterial lesion, but, uh, arterial lesion, but the absence of a physical exam finding certainly doesn't exclude uh, an arterial lesion. And so serial angiographic assessment is advisable in patients with large vessel vasculitis uh, to monitor for, for involvement. So how would we do that? So the historical gold standard here was obviously a catheter-directed angio, and it does have some uh, advantages that remain pertinent uh, today in, in terms of getting an accurate central aortic blood pressure or permitting vascular intervention. But the downsides in terms of only visualizing the lumen, not the vessel wall, and also the exposure to radiation contrast and the invasive nature of the procedure have all led to it falling uh, away um, in terms of its use as compared to some of the newer modalities, for example, MR angiography, which has, does have the advantage of seeing not just the lumen in, uh, in terms of the, the stomatic or aneurysmal lesions, but also the vessel wall abnormalities in terms of thickening or enhancement. Uh, and it also has the advantage of being non-invasive and not associated with any radiation. Downsides do include uh, the cost and availability uh, of it and some uncertainty in terms of the uh, in, in interpretation of the increased signal or thickening in the vessel wall over serial imaging. Um, and uh, also the exposure to gadolinium in, in patients with renal failure. Um, there are some patients that obviously can't undergo an MR uh, because of claustrophobia or implantable devices. Um, however, uh, CT angio is an alternative in these patients and uh, it does have the avail uh, availability advantage. It is generally very well tolerated and it can visualize the structural uh, abnormalities as well as taking an enhancement in the vessel wall, although that seems to regress very quickly after starting steroid. Calcification can also be uh, documented on CT, um, which points toward atheroma. Um, the downsides obviously include the radiation, the contrast toxicity. And again, there's a question mark in terms of the relevance of persistent uh, thickening seen on serial imaging. Ultrasound is uh, useful uh, for uh, some arteries, for example, the auxiliary arteries, uh, and is obviously well tolerated. Again, there's no radiation or contrast imaging, uh, contrast exposure. Um, but the downsides obviously, again, it's operator dependent. Uh, and it may not be available in your center. And the big drawback really is the inability to visualize the thoracic aorta. So PET scanning is probably uh, one of the major advances um, in, in recent years in imaging large vessels. Um, and uh, certainly the, the vascular FDG uptake uh, can, in a concentric fashion can point strongly toward the diagnosis of large vessel vasculitis. It's obviously non-invasive and can visualize the whole body. And it can, may also rule out other diagnoses, for example, certain malignancies and um, that um, uh, might be in the differential for patients, for example, with um, elevated ESR fevers, et cetera. Um, abnormal uh, PET uptake um, at baseline does predict the later development of aortic dilatation. The downside is you, is you uh, look for structural lesions. And uh, the, again, the interpretation of low grade uptake over time um, is uncertain. Um, and the results of open radiation exposure and cost and availability is probably one of the biggest barriers. So, um, unfortunately, as you, as you can see in the slide, there are at least as many questions as there are modalities um, and, and further work remains to be done in terms of if the modality. This is a new approach using new PET ligands and there's a, a lot of interest in this area. Um, there's also a, pet, a hybrid PET MRI technique that um, looks very promising and has a, a significant reduction in the radiation exposure as compared to PET CT. But again, further study is, is needed here. Um, so for diagnosis, um, the imaging is part of the evaluation for patients with suspected tachyacid, but really, it, it, uh, as I've alluded to, it should probably be considered as part of this. of the screening um, in all patients with giant cell arteritis. That's, that's uh, symptomatically and maybe the diagnosis to obtain a clear baseline prior to starting steroids or other immunosuppressive therapy. Um, the optimal modality may well be uh, MRI um, uh, if available. Um, in patients with established large vessel vasculitis, serial imaging is advised. Um, uh, it may be difficult to interpret the findings and certainly worsening of a pre-existing lesion is not necessarily felt to reflect active diseases. This might relate to secondary atherosclerosis that's uh, uh, going to be more common, particularly in patients that have other vascular risk factors. 
Um, a new lesion in a previously unaffected vascular tertiary is felt to be the most uh, clear-cut uh, finding that would support uh, the, uh, the uh, diagnosis of a relapse. And the optimal modality, again, is most likely MRI uh, if available. Uh, the interval is certainly not clear, but in patients with tachyasis, uh, typically they'll be imaged on a six to 12 monthly basis. Um, the, the downside from the tachyasis point of view is that the inflammatory markers really aren't that reliable in terms of uh, diagnosing relapse. Um, and even if they're elevated, we do need to consider other things like infections, which are more common in patients with immunity. of therapy and also um, so the acute phase reactants. Um, so um, I think I've kind of mentioned these really, but, uh, but I guess the key point is that only a new lesion in a previously unaffected vascular tertiary should be considered as evidence of active disease. Um, so um, this was a certain extent made for determining disease activity, um, but uh, the sobering finding is that 51% uh, of patients that were felt to be on clinical remission had evidence of active disease on PET and, and MR and U. Histology is rarely available in patients with large vessel vasculitis and uh, surgery is uh, generally undertaken in periods of remission. Any bypass procedure will be into a normal appearing vessel segment. But nevertheless, approximately half the surgical spe specimens will show evidence of, of active uh, vasculitis, um, which uh, does obviously raise questions over the efficacy of our treatments in terms of eradicating vascular inflammation. So just to, to move on then to the treatment, so steroids obviously are the mainstay of treatment and commenced immediately once the diagnosis is suspected. We don't wait around for the temporal artery biopsy. And um, uh, before I move on to the bad stuff, just to mention that there are some benefits of glucocorticoids in terms of symptomatic improvement uh, and reduced risk of vision loss, although they cannot reverse established vision loss. And then uh, they normalize the ESR and CRP, so keep the doctor happy. Um, however, there are many drawbacks to the, to the use of steroids. Um, these are just an abbreviated list of the side effects of steroids. And if we look specifically in a cohort of GCA patients, this was again from the Mayo Clinic, and they found that adverse events related to steroids were up to 3.3 fold higher than age and sex match controls, which include nasty things like fractures, uh, cataracts, infections requiring hospitalization and new onset diabetes. This is the isotope bone scan from a patient of mine who developed six simultaneous vertebral fractures uh, despite a starting dose of steroids of only 30 milligrams of prednisolone for her GCA. So uh, the initial treatment of large vessel vasculitis involves steroids and then lots of other tablets that we tend to prescribe to counteract the, the side effects of steroids. Uh, um, so at least we can console ourselves with the fact that they work, maybe not. So if we look at retrospective studies and in particular in prospective studies, there's a, there are very high relapse rates in patients treated with steroids. And, and we, when we think a little about the pathophysiology uh, of GCA, we can understand that because steroids will block this TH17 pathway, but not this TH1 pathway. So that's a, this is why we, we see persistent inflammation on delayed biopsy and autopsy, as I've alluded to earlier, and why we see frequent relapses and late complications in patients with GCA. We do have other immunosuppressive agents that we use, uh, for example, methotrexate, tocilizumab, osteokinumab, and abatacept uh, most frequently. And we do sometimes consider other treatments than aspirins and, and uh, aspirin and statins. Um, this is um, just to remind me. Uh, to talk about hypertension. So this is a patient with uh, tachyasis. You can see this, uh, this uh, a number of occlusions here, um, but essentially three or four, four limb vessels are not going to give you a reliable blood pressure uh, reading, which is likely to be elevated given her renal artery stenosis. So um, clearly she needs to have her uh, the blood pressure assessed in the patent blood vessel. And we need to tell the patient what that blood vessel should be. Um, so, um, because uh, hypertension is really a, a big problem for patients with large vessel vasculitis, because uh, as uh, shown in this uh, in that patient, hypertension may go unidentified because of peripheral arterial stenosis, and they may present with evidence of end organ damage. In some cases, um, if there's four limb involvement, catheter directed angio may actually be required to measure the central aortic pressure. Antihypertensive therapy must be judiciously introduced to prevent worsening of ischemic symptoms. And ongoing monitoring of blood pressure can remain a challenging dilemma given the absence uh, of, a, of a reliable method of non-invasive assessment of the central pressure. 
So we do continue to look for evidence of end organ damage in these patients. So in terms of vascular intervention, and I'm really not going to go out of my comfort zone into any technicalities, but uh, the general approach is that we try to avoid a, a kind of reflex plumbing approach in terms of if it's blocked, that we need to unblock it. Because these patients develop stenosis and occlusions in a, in a very slow fashion, and they typically have very extensive collateralization. So really di uh, digital or limb is ischemia is uh, extremely rare and would raise the question of, of an alternative uh, process. Um, but also there are high failure rates uh, in terms of the interventions. The stenotic lesions are often long and calcified and fibrotic, so careful selection of lesions for intervention is essential. The suboptimal outcomes um, uh, really uh, uh, relate to the high risk stenosis rates up to 60%. Um, particularly uh, the, uh, high, it, it seems, with stenting as compared to balloon angioplasty in the renal arteries, uh, less of a differential in terms of other arterial beds. Um, but also, uh, if the patient is in drug-free remission, uh, there seems to be 100% long-term patency in, in this study versus 33% who had a procedure performed in, in the setting of active disease. Post-procedural immunosuppression may reduce the risk of restenosis. Um, the efficacy of newer approaches really uh, are, are unclear as of yet, uh, such as the drug eluting stents. Uh, in terms of the, the aortic root reconstruction, vascular bypass grafts, or other uh, surgical interventions, again, really um, the, the uh, feeling is that a, a vascular bypass is optimally from the aortic root uh, because there's a high likelihood, 90%, uh, uh, for involvement of, for example, the subclavian arteries. Um, with the disease process over time. And obviously, if that becomes included, you may lose any, any bypass from that vessel. Um, the, again, the interventions are best performed during periods of disease remission. Uh, overall, the, uh, there's a, a five-year complication rate of uh, 44%. Um, but in, in this, uh, this was a frame study, there was a seven-fold increased risk of failure if there was evidence of inflammation. So again, really harking back to the importance of good disease control before um, and uh, during and after any, any vascular intervention. This was a study for uh, a recent study from Australia where they looked at a, 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 their National Surgical Registry, a prospective study between 04 and 2018. They have uh, 41 of over a thousand uh, temporal, or, uh, sorry, thoracic aortic re uh, repairs surgeries um, uh, that had uh, vasculitis. Um, and these aortitis patients were more likely to be female, older. And hypertensive patients, but surgical outcomes and mortality were comparable, and it didn't appear that perioperative steroids or immunosuppressive therapy uh, worsened uh, the outcomes from the from the procedure. Um, so, with that, uh, um, we'll stop. And thank you for for your attention, uh, and I'm very happy to uh, answer any questions. Um, thank you very much, Eamon. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, very good. Okay, so I apologise for the earlier technical problems. Now, unfortunately, I now don't have access to the live Q&A, so if anyone has questions, perhaps they could, um, somebody could uh, let me know. I don't know if you have access to them, Eamon. Um, yeah, let me just... Um... So let me just let me just start by um, asking. I suppose what what your presentation has has reassured us is what we've always believed that these patients with systemic vasculitis we should at all costs avoid intervention, either endovascular or surgical. Um, well, I, I I think certainly uh, being judicious about it um, and uh, you know realizing that the collateralization may mi minimize the the symptoms, for example, in terms of claudication over time, um, and that we try to optimize their immunosuppressive therapy and potentially other things like aspirin or statins, etc., to uh, to minimize uh, the 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 progression of the the vascular lesion. Um, I mean, I think procedures, you know, certainly can be done. I, I think just that, that to the fullest extent possible that we, um, th that we ensure that their disease uh, is well controlled. And it, as, it, as it certainly appears that that, that will uh, uh, increase the likelihood of a, of a better outcome from the, from the procedure. Um, okay. And in terms, if you are absolutely forced, in terms of if, if, if you have a patient with rest pain or tissue loss, um, are there any any um, are there any 
steps you can take to to mitigate the the risk of complications or what are the expected complications is it false aneurysm formation or early restenosis yeah I, I i think i think all of the above you know depending on the procedure and as you point out sometimes you you just have to go ahead and and uh, you know do it uh, if there's an acute uh, situation um you know i think that that um Considering uh, perioperative um, steroids or immunosuppressive therapy uh, would be certainly worthwhile. It, it, you know, again, would require patient careful selection um, in that regard. Um, and you know, if there's a, for example, a very clearly inflamed vessel um, on, um, you know, PET scan, etc., um, th then then that might very well be a consideration. Um, and certainly, if it's an endovascular procedure. Uh, you know, the, the risks associated with uh, 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 periprocedural steroids uh, or, other, or other immunosuppressive therapy uh, would, be, would be pretty minimal. Um, the, um, it also seems as if maintaining good immunosuppressive control of the, uh, of the inflammation in, in the weeks and months after the procedure is important as well in terms of reducing the risk of restenosis. Okay. Um so thank you very much, Eamon, and um, thank you also to Dr. Kibbe, and I apologise for losing my audio just at the end of your presentation. So I think we've, we've come to the end of our session for this morning, and it just remains for me to thank everybody for three excellent presentations, um, to Mr. Madani, Professor Malloy, and to Dr. Kibbe, particularly for taking the time to um, to give us an excellent um, and very enlightening presentation that we won't forget in a hurry. Um, so just to say thank you again to everybody and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>